So I would like to talk about some challenges, uh, data-intensive statistical challenges in astrophysics. And data is exploding. So you just have to look at, so there are different types of astronomical data. So we are looking at the cosmic microwave background sky with satellites. We are looking at galaxy positions on the sky. Those are the angular galaxy surveys. We are measuring distances to galaxies through spectra. And you can just look at, as a function of time, you can just have a look at the length of the numbers, basically. That illustrates how much our knowledge about celestial objects is growing. But the real thing is just about to begin. So we are starting now. So far, we were mostly looking at the static sky. So, so the areas of the sky over which we had time domain information was tiny. And, and now we are starting the large areas time domain surveys. And uh, this will completely change astronomy. <clears throat> so I, my whole kind of uh, life changed in 1992 when Johns Hopkins joined the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And it was roughly starting at the same time as the Human Genome Project. And the idea was that the technology is just about right to go out and map the whole northern sky that is visible from the US. And so we ended up building a special purpose telescope that is sitting out on the edge of the mesa in New Mexico so that the airflow is laminar and looking down onto white sands. And it's freestanding, so it doesn't have a dome. It just has a garage, kind of an aluminum garage that we can slide over it. And it had the world's largest camera for a long time. It had 120 million pixels. And in 1992, that was a really big number. And we set out to do, take about two and a half trillion pixels of images. We ended up taking about five, uh, five trillion pixels. We wanted to get about 10 terabytes of raw data. In the end, with all the versioning, and we also collected a lot more data than we thought we would, we have now about 120 terabytes of processed data that we, once the project finished in 2008, we kind of had to archive this. And we originally projected in 92 that we would have about half a terabyte of catalogs. So these are the results of image segmentation. We ended up with 35 terabytes in the end. And of course, when we started in 1992, the project was supposed to finish in 2000 with telescope observations, lock, stock, and barrels. It didn't even begin until 2001. So, so everything slipped. But luckily, then this helped because the disk prices have dramatically fallen. CPUs became much faster. So we could process a lot more data and we could even store it. And we could afford to store a lot more data products than we originally envisaged. So <clears throat> the project is really two surveys in one. So we did not only image the sky in five colors, which was already a huge improvement over previous surveys, because we had the same systematic errors in five different, so basically in five bands of the visible spectrum. And then based upon that data, we ran an image segmentation routine, which detected galaxies and stars, and then we classified the objects, and then we selected the million brightest object for spectroscopy, most of them galaxies, and then we measured spectra for those objects. And given Hubble's law for the expansion of the universe, if we have a spectrum of a galaxy, and we see the features in the spectrum, we can detect the redshift, so how the galaxy is moving, how fast the galaxy is moving away from us. And since Hubble's law says that a galaxy which is moving twice as fast, is, or which is twice as far, is moving twice as fast away from us, we can turn these spectral, these Doppler shifts into distances. And so that would be actually, that was one of the first three-dimensional maps that we created. And so today I would like to talk about the challenges of working with galaxy spectra. And so we have actually quite a lot of different astronomical statistical challenges, but I felt that, you know, given 30 minutes or 25 minutes, I should focus rather on one subject. And basically, galaxy spectra in Sloan are 4,000 pixels long, and they cover from the ultraviolet to the near infrared. And it's basically a sparse signal in many dimensions. So we have 4,000 4, dimensional vector. We have about a million spectra. We have quite a lot of noise, and we also have some very rare events. 
And some of the rare events are astronomical, other rare events are just simply instrumental errors, and, and something has gone wrong. There was a car driving up the mountain, and then there was reflected light in the spectrograph. Then, <clears throat> so, but anyway, if we wanted to brute force it, it's quite, if we wanted to do, for example, a PCA, it's quite a challenging problem. So already just doing the PCA of the galaxy spectra is a reasonably substantial computation. And then this motivated a lot of uh, ideas about how to work on, and, and kind of told us that we really need to do things differently. And we started to work on randomized and incremental algorithms. But basically, this, these are typical galaxy spectra. So the one on the top is that of an elliptical galaxy, which is quite red in color, and that's an old galaxy typically. And the younger and the, the lower object is an elliptic, or it's a spiral galaxy, which is also, besides the stellar populations, has a whole bunch of gaseous regions, the, which are so-called H2 regions, which emit light in very strong emission lines. And these are typically lines of hydrogen, et cetera, a small number of elements. And so we have basically separate, we have emissions from the continuum, which is coming from the stellar population, and then we have the sharp lines which come from the gas in the, in the galaxies. And if we build up a PCA for all the spectra that we have, actually, so of course the first PCA component gives us the average spectrum, the second one gives kind of the deviation, the aging of the stellar continuum. Then, then also we get more and more of the finer continuum features than how the in, so-called intermediate age population shows up, which shows up actually in how the Balmer lines, the lines of hydrogen change very quickly. And then farther down around the fifth principle components, we also start to see the features coming from the absorption due to the different metals. In astronomy, everything basically heavier than helium is metal. So carbon and oxygen and so on, they are all metals for astronomers. Okay, so instead of doing the brute force big SVD, so Tomasz Budavari, this is a work really led by Tomasz Budavari, who is an associate research professor at Hopkins. So the idea was, could we actually do an incremental computation of the PCA? So that we do a cold start and we take a small random subset. Typically here we want to keep a, third, a truncated PCA, so we want to keep the first N principal component, which is typically five, five to 10. And so basically we then compute the, Co covariance or correlation matrix and truncate it at the first uh, P eigenvalues or eigenvectors. And then afterwards, we keep adding just like if we compute the mean in an incremental fashion, we basically have a memory parameter gamma, which is very close to one. And so we keep basically the, we add to the mix the old basis and then the outer product of the new vector Okay, so the correlate, the, co the contribution of the new vector and with a one minus gamma weight, and then basically then try to update the, so we try to write down the correlation matrix as a, a transpose. And okay, this works like a charm, so no big deal. However, then along comes a bad vector, which is an instrumental error, which is way, way out, and the fluxes are all wrong, and suddenly the whole Eigen system is, is, is perturbed and the eigenvalues go to hell. And so Tomas saw, read a couple of papers on robust uh, algorithms and he realized that at the same time when we are doing these upgrades, we could actually consider a robust PCA algorithm where basically this is due to Marona and so the idea that instead of solving the quadratic problem, the quadratic cost function problem, we have a cost function which asymptotically goes to one. So it asymptotes at very small signals, it asymptotes a parabola, so a quadratic function, but then essentially the wings flatten out and goes to one. And then one can work from, from this uh, robust function rho. So you can see that if the robust function is basically unity, and this delta, this crossover factor is one, then we essentially go back to the, quadrat the normal PCA problem. 
but, but basically, one can then pick different functions for like either logarithmic wing, wings or whatever. This then, the derivative of this gives us this so weight factors. And then essentially, not, we are not just solving for the quadratic, uh, for the correlation matrix, but we are also solving basically for the scale factor, for sigma simultaneously. So the memory gives us that what is the right transition between the quadratic to, to the asymptotic scale. Okay, and this can be beautifully in included in the incremental algorithm. So this shows if we, so this is basically running a training. So here comes a stream of vectors, but in the stream of vectors, wherever on the other side where there is a dot, this means there is a vector which is a huge outlier in the input data stream. And you can see that every time when those come in, they basically kick the eigenvalues. This shows the eigenvalues ranked, and the first rank is the red, and so on. And you can see that as soon as we get a perturbation, the first eigen, or all the eigenvalues are kicked way out. And once we have, on the other hand, the robust algorithm, there is a little bit of glitch in the eigen system because they still have a little effect, but, but the effect is actually very much suppressed. So the robust algorithm works really like a charm. And on Sloan, once we have drawn randomly vectors from the million spectra, we found that after 15,000 vector, uh, after 15,000 vectors drawn randomly from the ensemble, the whole eigenbasis converged beautifully. And we were done in 15 minutes instead of a week of computation. So we then started to apply this to different algorithms and so different studies of galaxy spectra. And so here I would like to talk about two projects. One is the principal component pursuit. That's an algorithm uh, originally uh, Emmanuel Condis came up. And the other is about important sampling, which ties in very nicely with uh, Petros and Michael's talks. So the principal component pursuit, it tries to decompose this signal into two sparse components. One is a sparse subspace, which is still embedded into the 4,000 dimensional space. And the other is, on the other hand, sparse along the wavelength direction, so in the vector components. And basically, so I think I shouldn't spend too much time on this. I would rather show the figures. That explains much clearer. So this is basically a whole bunch of galaxy spectra from Sloan, essentially all the galaxy spectra. And <coughs> we used the streaming robust PC implementation. It, it was actually implemented as a user-defined function in the database. So, so we, could, we didn't even have to extract the spectra from the database, but we could run it essentially inside the database. So the spectra didn't leave the backplane of the machine. And so this is when we run the standard PCA. And this is a reconstruction using five PCA, the first five PCA components, and shows the residuals. And you can see that we got kind of a mix of a both, both of a young and an old galaxy overall when we reconstructed the mean spectrum. Uh, <coughs> I actually, sorry, yeah, so this was, I think, after the residual after five components, but this is, I think, the first component. In any case, that picks up both the kind of the continuum shape of an elliptical galaxy, but superimposed on it, there are a bunch of the big typical emission lines. And we have a residual. Okay, when we run the principal pers component pursuit, that really separates very nicely the shape of the continuum and the discrete emission lines. And these are basically the most important emission lines in the, the, in the galaxy spectra. And we can see that the residual is much, much smaller. Okay. So the other project is led by ching Yip, who is an assistant research scientist at Hopkins. And this has been done in collaboration with Michael. And it, so basically, we heard about the CX decomposition. And so here the idea, again, that we take a bunch of galaxy spectra and perform the CX decomposition and then look at the important sampling. So I don't go into detail since there were two talks about it. So this shows basically just different K values. And you can see that essentially how the relevance score is changing as we increase the degrees of freedom of the system. And <clears throat> 
So you can see, in the, so after k equals 2, we basically still see that much of the information and the relevance is down at around 4,000 angstroms. As we increase, basically, the number of degrees of freedom, we are also starting to pick up much narrower and sharper regions. Why is this interesting? So in astronomy, over the last few decades, astronomers have realized that instead of looking at the whole spectrum, we can learn a lot more about galaxy properties and focusing a small number of, of regions in the spectrum, so-called leak indices, where we can measure the fluxes in those regions. And then afterwards, from those, there are certain indices this, of these leak indices which correlate very well with metallicity, others correlate very well with age, and they derive these heuristic relations. And we were wondering, can we actually reconstruct classical astronomy based upon entirely statistical principles and important sampling? So these are the so-called leak indices. And so there is a big list of those that what are the wavelength, narrow wavelength region, and what are the dif different units. And basically, Tsinghua then computed, so first just simply took those regions literally and added up the relevant score or important score and for, for all the different uh, indices and computed for the leak indices. And we can see that the leverage score, kind of the largest, is about 0.115, roughly. This, remember this number for comparison later. And indeed, the D4000 is the most famous one of all these indices. So it all works nicely. OK. So then Tsinghua used two different algorithms in consultation with Michael. So <coughs> eventually in the paper, there will be probably slightly more imaginative names for the algorithms. <laughs> but these are the working definitions. So anyway, so we basically pick the largest P lambdas. And then, of course, the adjacent lambdas are not independent in a spectrum. They are correlated with one another. There is a natural line width in the spectrum due to the thermal motion of the stars and the gas in the galaxy spectrum. So we have to, we have to broaden those regions. We cannot just pick the peaks. Okay, and so basically we try to pick and try to pick two different algorithms. How do we grow these regions around the peaks of the leverage score to actually identify regions of finite widths? And actually, both methods work. The Mahoney second works better. So. <laughs> So basically, this shows a typical galaxy spectrum. The gray regions show the leak indices. And these are the red regions are basically still the narrow definitions of, of some of these regions without the growth factor. And you can see that, that most of them correspond indeed to strong features in the spectrum. And we believe that the number two, for example, that essentially samples the continuum. So we also need something that overall samples the continuum shape. OK. And again, f just to see with the relevant score, you can see basically the matching features. So, so this is how these were picked. OK. So if it's k equals 5, and, and grow, applying a certain growth factor, we picked basically of the order of, of uh, 15 regions along the spectrum, and then organized and ordered them by the relevant score. And by the way, these are the comparisons between the different ways of, of growing some of the regions and picking and thresholding. But essentially, for most of the important regions, we basically pick up those either. either uh, OK, how can we then define different schemes? The leak indices, for example, versus the or versus the, uh, the objective leverage score-based regions. And one can, combine, one can compute an angle. So this is the definition if we have two subspaces, which may have different dimensions. So we can basically define a matrix, an n by m or q by p matrix, which is basically just the, the dot product of the, of the two bases. And one can have a dimension q, the other is a dimension p. And then basically the the determinant of M, M uh, transpose M 
is a, can be used as a cosine theta squared. Okay. So the leak indices, one can see that the, the things that handpicked by the astronomers are essentially quite correlated with each other, whereas the objectively defined subsets are actually very nicely. We, we still have some of diagonal elements, but they are very weak. So they don't even show up on the grayscale, on the same grayscale. Okay. So this means that one can put uh, there is hope to improve. Because this means if we took combinations of the different leak indices, we combine them, for example, different ways, or extended them a little differently, one can do actually better in the determinations. And indeed, when we compute then the leverage score for the different leak indices, and then some of the regions defined this way, you can see that here our leverage score is something like 0.18. So all, not quite twice as good as, as the astronomy, the hand-picked astronomy wants, but, but substantially better. Okay. And then the question is how well it works in a physical scenario. And this just shows basically that by comparing fluxes in two of these regions, so measuring the fluxes in these intervals, and then how does it correlate with some physical properties like age of the galaxy. And this shows basically that this would give us, so if this is the flux in region seven, and then we pick a flux in region eight, then the two of them would give us the age of the galaxy. And th this is the sigma, the error in the age, me all measured in billions of years. So this is actually darn good. So, so. <clears throat> and so basically summarizing, so we have this set of <clears throat> this, we, we have this set of regions defined over the galaxy spectra by astronomers, historically, the leak indices, and they are ad hoc. The new indices are objective, and they were really derived in an algorithmic basis on statistical principles. They recover the important lines that we know about, the molecular bands. We actually recover much of the astronomy regions. But actually, these are orthogonal to one another, and they also give an improved estimation. In the future, we would like to include also the emission lines in this game. And also, we are going to focus on the parameter inversion. So how can we use this then actually invert the information from spectra going to age and metallicity? And I would like to kind of summarize here that what we see with these big data sets, not just in astronomy, but overall in science, that we see basically non-incremental non changes on the way. And what is particularly profound is how we are using now data to derive our hypothesis instead of using hypothesis to get our data and collect our data. And what is also clear that as the data sizes are exploding, we need increasingly randomized and incremental algorithms so when I grew up, in astronomy, we had like a, a thousand galaxies with distances. So the, most of the statistical techniques we learned is how to minimize the statistical noise, how to do minimum variance estimators. Okay, of course, those algorithms typically involve inverting the covariance matrix. When the covariance matrix, the linear size is doubling every year, the computational problem is going to hell. So we won't be able to do this any longer. And, and in those days, basically, the, getting the data was the hardest thing, and the computations could be done essentially on a, on a desktop calculator. And today, on the other hand, it's, the situation is turning upside down, so we need to include in the cost function the cost of computation, which means we have to include, so we need algorithms which improve the accuracy as we sample more. So this screams for randomized and incremental algorithms. And we have to get, we have to formulate our statistical problem to get the best result in one minute or one hour or one day. Okay. The other important thing that is changing, that the dominant source of error in these very large surveys is not statistical any longer because we have a lot of objects. But it's the systematic errors that we don't know. 
So we also do have to come up with different statistics. Those, for example, which are robust, they can tolerate instrumental errors, or they project the data, the raw data, into such subspaces which are orthogonal to the known systematic errors so that we can clean up the data. So all these projections and higher dimensional projections are becoming increasingly important in this world. And this means that we need to come up with new computational tools and strategies. We have to come up with algorithms that are computable. They are not just statistically sound, but they are computable and scale well. And it is also, so we, have, we need people who are equally familiar in statistics, computer science, astronomy, and genomics, and so on. And I always kept wondering, why is it that astronomers have been actually at the forefront of this data explosion? And astronomy has always been data-driven. Why? Because in physical sciences, I can run an experiment on a desktop or at an accelerator, and I can go in and tweak the experimental setup. But what can I tweak on the sky? All that, all, all that astronomers have been able to do for thousands of years is just look at the sky and basically look at it maybe a little differently, but we cannot even change our position within the universe. We can only look at the universe from one particular position. So it's no wonder that kind of astrono to astronomers, we are learning it from day one that this is, this is the way the world is, <laughs> and we have to live with it, and we have to do our science with the data that, that's coming down in photons. Thank you. Thank you.